So thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, today. We're excited to be launching our research report on micro credentials that was um, that came out yesterday. And so this webinar today will be recorded and shared on our YouTube page for your colleagues who were not able to make it today. Alors, uh, my name is Denise Emio. I'm President CEO of Colleges Institutes Canada. And uh, I'm very, very pleased that we can share this uh, report with you. And of course, if you have not yet read the report, you can do so on our website. We will be sharing the link uh, with you in the chat box. So before we begin, I, I think it's always good to know how much uh, you, the audience, know about micro-credentials. So some of you that have attended our webinars, you all know the process. So please log into your Android or your iPhone uh, on slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and use the code um, how do you call that mark in English? Number, uh, CI can underlined micro credit, uh, you that you can see on your screen and to answer the first questions. I will not read the first questions, but uh, uh, as you know, when you will begin to answer it, we will see immediately the answers to, to that. So as you know, the pandemic has accelerated the changes anticipated in the workplace. We are all living it. And whether it's because uh, we work uh, in our virtual home offices or because we, we play with virtual, uh, virtual tools, we all rely on technology right now. And micro-credentials, in fact, what they are showing, they, they have uh, a promise of flexibility in them and something of a short duration to offer learners that are impacted by the changes an opportunity to gain a credential to help them to reskill or upskill as they need. So you may have heard me last month at the, as the eCampus Forum on uh, micro-credentials when I talked about the importance of developing a systems approach to micro-credentials. And part of that is really to have a common definitions and principles for our sector. And since last year, there's a group of college vice president uh, academic from across Canada that have worked together to develop a common definition and common guiding principles. And through the research that led to our own report, and in collaborations with the group of vice presidents and the heads of college regional associations, we were able to validate and finalize the definition and the guiding principles, which were released in fact on March 25th. It's also available on our website we have a specific section now on micro-credentials. You will see the link in the chat box. So thanks to the work of those vice presidents and thank, thanks also to the regional associations that provided valuable input to ensure that the principles were reflective of the work on the ground across the country. This was something very important. So this definition and the guiding principles are not intended to be prescriptive, but to provide 
a structure to provide those credentials uh, a framework, if you want. Uh, I like to say that it describes the mechanics of a micro-credential, and it can lend itself to different types of learning, whether hands-on or theoretical courses. What is important is that it is content agnostic. We do believe that as these credentials evolve, and the definitions and principles will also evolve. The definition that emerge describes a micro-credential as a certification of assessed competencies. And that's very important, assessed competencies that is additional or alternate or complementary or a component of a formal qualification. On the other hand, the guiding principles, they articulate how colleges and institutes approach the development of micro-credentials. And this ensures that these courses meet the needs of students, meet the needs of employers, who we all know have a critical role to play in identifying the skills needed in their respective sectors. So we know that lifelong learning is becoming the norm. And it means that we are seeing an increasing demand for more flexible pathways for learners. So what is important is that we are hearing from students that they are eager to learn competencies that will get them in the workplace quickly. They want to have an edge. So this is a way, in fact, to expand on and complement outcomes-based and competency-based learning to move towards options, other than the semester system, which starts either in September, January, or in May. And it's very important. And what it does, it gives short courses and part-time students equal standing within post-secondary institutions. And it means that these types of offerings, answers, students' needs, learners' needs. Last fall, we began a research project to learn more about micro-credentials, to validate the definitions and principles, and to learn what the emergence of micro-credentials look like at our own member institutions. And I'm pleased today to welcome CI CAN's researchers, Diane McGee and Peter Serras, to speak to you about the findings of our environmental scan. And after you will hear from our partners from HECO, Jackie Pichette and Sarah Bromwell, who will share some of their findings on learner and employer perspectives that we conducted at the same time. So, Diane and Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Denise. So, to answer your question earlier, I I'm not a, an expert on micro-credentials, but uh, luckily uh, I work for CI CAN and we have a, a whole network of, uh, of experts uh, across our many member institutions. And uh, so, one of the issues, I guess, that we were trying to uh, cover for is that uh, each uh, institution will have uh, its own uh, own a definition of micro-credentials and each ju jurisdiction will, will think of it a little differently. So we tried to put together this uh, research uh, project to, uh, uh, to get an, an overview that would be helpful for learners and also potential employees and employers uh, to recognize the value of a, a micro-credential. Uh, and so as you see on the screen, we, uh, we used a, a mixed methods approach to, to get at this, uh, including a, a literature re review uh, a survey, as Denise pointed out, uh, with our partners in HECO and BHER, 
and uh, also interviews with key informants uh, to help us get as comprehensive of a, an overview of my credentials as possible. Um, so to give you a little bit of an uh, uh, outline of the survey itself, uh, we got 64 of our members to respond uh, and the survey went throughout uh, November and December of 2020. Uh, you see on the uh, right hand side here the uh, uh, regional breakdown of our respondents and we were quite happy with, uh, with most of the, uh, the representation here. So it gives us uh, something to build on for, for understanding the, uh, the overall situation. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide, we'll look at a little bit about uh, uh, how micro-credentials are offered at CICAM members. And as you can see, uh, they are uh, quite well uh, offered across our membership, uh, both in terms of actually being offered at the moment and uh, being considered for future offerings. Uh, almost, uh, almost nine in 10 respondents uh, mentioned that uh, this was on the table or currently on the table, uh, both online and in person. Now, what does that mean in terms of, uh, uh, of how that's actually being implemented? You see uh, nine in 10 uh, respondents saying that the, the institution is open to working with industry. And this is a theme that I'll, or a refrain that I'll keep going on as we go through these uh, uh, responses. Uh, nine in 10 say that the, the leadership is encouraging the development. Uh, but on the other hand, less than half are saying that their institution has a, a framework uh, for, or a strategy for implementing micro-credentials. Uh, one in four uh, says that their institution has allocated sufficient resources uh, for our program. Uh, so there's some room for development uh, in these areas, and uh, we'll, we'll touch on these points later on uh, in terms of the interviews as well. Now, at the bottom of this list of, uh, of items, you'll see that the, there's not a lot of agreement in that the private sector is better suited as a provider of my credentials. This, this seems to be an area that uh, uh, colleges and institutes uh, can, can, can own, according to our responses. Uh, and uh, only 5% say that micro credentials are a fad an indication that uh, this is something that's staying around, something that needs to be developed and something that we need to, to focus on. Uh, so if you move on, uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, who micro-credentials are, are made for, what's the target market. Um, in our survey, we found that uh, two of the top three are, are uh, people in the, in the labor market. So those uh, seeking to progress in their current career or those uh, looking to change in their uh, change careers. Uh, we also saw a, a tie to industry uh, partners there in that uh, a target market is uh, industry partner employees. At the bottom, you have international students, uh, those upgrading basic skills, uh, faculty and staff. And so it, it seems like the, uh, the offering is towards uh, people that are in the labor market and trying to respond to industry needs. Uh, moving on. Uh, we also asked uh, about important features of micro-credentials. Uh, you see here uh, on the left-hand side, the top uh, favorable rating uh, rated uh, features, and on the right-hand side, the bottom uh, favored uh, uh, features. And again, notice that the top industry alignment is key. Uh, and as you saw reflected in our definition, competency, uh, having a competency-based approach is uh, also uh, very important short durations, uh, a common understanding, and also uh, the idea of uh, stackable programs. Now on the bottom, uh, items uh, like uh, being online or standardized, uh, digitally secured and accredited, and also digitally in integrated. Some of these are common concepts that come up when, uh, when we talk about micro-credentials, but they're lower down in terms of uh, what's deemed important, at least in terms of uh, those that responded to our survey. Uh, if you want to uh, talk about interviews, uh, I'll pass the uh, mic now to, uh, uh, to Diane, who will go a little bit into uh, the key informants that we uh, responded to. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yes, as you, can, as you can see there, we, we conducted online interviews on a regional basis. 14 member institutions uh, were uh, contacted, and this included a number of different types of institutions, East, West and Central, North and South, urban and rural. So we feel, um, uh, although it's a relatively small number that we, we uh, do have a good sense of our various uh, members, our various types of members. And the results of the interviews confirm the results of the survey, basically. Um, colleges and inst institutes are very interested in micro-credentials and are in various stages of implementation. The landscape is changing very rapidly. 
Uh, the main impetus, of course, is the response to the needs of local industry and local people who are in the labor market or trying to enter the labor market after um, needing uh, reskilling and upskilling. Um, the pandemic, as Denise pointed out, has, of course, exacerbated the urgency of the situation. But one interesting thing is that people interviewed uh, also often emphasize what they say is innovative characteristics of micro-credentials. They, they see them as very future-oriented in terms of where uh, post-secondary education is moving. Um, the flexibility, for one thing, can allow learners to proceed at their own pace. Um, this flexibility includes, for instance, asynchronous learning or even off, um, asynchronous online learning or even offline possibilities for remote regions where the internet connection is perhaps um, more difficult. Also, the fact that they are competency-based may allow some learners to receive uh, recognition through uh, prior learning assessment. And that would in, in, in also assist in terms of how fast they can get through the programs and how quickly they can get into the labor market. This can be um, very helpful for people who uh, have limited time, limited finances, and so forth. In many cases, the stackability will allow transfers into other certificate, diploma, or degree programs. Again, this is interesting for learners who perhaps um, are a bit worried about getting back into education or training, who will dare to take one course, one series of courses, and then potentially go on further. Uh, which could help them in the long run as well. So in, in, in these three points, we're talking about a learner-centered approach that could allow learners to eventually create their own learning path and might make micro-credentials more accessible to people who are marginalized or have not traditionally taken part in further education, people with work commitments, family commitments also and so forth. And this was very interesting. It came up frequently in the interviews. Of course, most important is the close link with employers that enhances job possibilities and um, advancement in, the, in a person's career. Um, the interviews also confirmed the definition of target markets, markets in the survey responses, target clientele, I should say, that we've, we've just noticed. First, focusing on people seeking to advance in the labor market. Um, but secondarily, people who have not had access to training in the past. And in the slide Peter showed in the middle there, there were people um, in remote communities and people who had uh, uh, people receiving benefits, the underrepresented, et cetera. So this is of, of concern to people and they're hoping, college representatives are obviously hoping that micro-credentials will work well for these groups as well. Now, having said that, there are differences, of course, as, as Peter mentioned, in how colleges and institutes are piloting and implementing or planning to implement micro-credentials. Um, some are offering them or will offer them on a course-by-course -course basis. So the, after a person takes a course, he or she receives a micro-credential, okay? In other cases, the micro-credential will be um, uh, awarded after the learner has com completed several courses. Um, so it's broken down into different courses or modules. Now, in that case, of course, the, the access to um, uh, recognition of competencies already attained can help the person, as we've said, get through and receive the, the micro-credential more quickly. Now, everybody, all interviewees talked about working closely with employers, and there are different ways in which they work with employers. That's detailed a bit more in the, in the report. Um, but some uh, colleges have offered micro-credential courses in response to a specific company's needs. In other words, at that end of the spectrum, there's an approach which is rather close to contract training in that approach to micro-credentials. And finally, um, some colleges talked about embedding micro-credentials in longer programs, uh, perhaps in a diploma or a, or, or a certificate program, so that as the uh, individual goes through the program, competencies will be attained and will be recognized and will be transcripted in some way so that they appear when the, the person goes out to look for a job. They, maybe it's a badge in some cases or, or some other way of 
recognizing credentials as they are attained in this longer program. The other piece of that that's interesting is if the person cannot finish the program for whatever reason, they do have recognition of micro credentials that have been attained within of competencies attained within uh, the studies that they have done to that point. And again, a number of colleges emphasized that they would like people uh, to be able to leave uh, a program and come back again. Um, the, the idea of flexibility for the adult learner is high um, on the list of priorities for many colleges. Okay, so as, as we've said, despite a variety of approaches, there is good agreement, a good deal of agreement on the definition and the guiding principles that were proposed originally by the Vice President's academic and have been since validated um, by other groups. And colleges also agreed in the importance of micro-credentials in the future. Everybody spoke about their development plans and they see this kind of offering as a crucial part in their um, uh, offerings at their institution. Uh, again, uh, as Denise mentioned, these students are seen uh, ideally as students who are on an equivalent basis with other students at the college or institute in terms of student support, in terms of student services, and so forth and so on. That seems to be the aim of most of the colleges and institutes. Um, in most cases, micro-credentials have been developed or are being developed in continuing education in that sector of the college, not everywhere, but in, in the majority of cases. Um, of course, continuing education sector does have a good deal of experience dealing with job-related courses and has good contacts with employers. Um, it was stated many times during interviews that colleges and institutes are in the best possible position it, uh, to offer micro-credentials uh, based on their traditional mandate and on their previous experience. Now, there were challenges raised and, um, for instance, uh, we talked about how uh, there, there is not always a framework in every college for micro-credentials. Some colleges are really devoting a lot of effort into developing their own frameworks. Others, I think, are more willing to to go along with a sort of uh, consensus as to what would be a framework. Um, in terms of resources, those are not always considered sufficient either. Yet, almost every uh, interviewee stated that the college was supportive of the development of micro-credentials. So I think this is evolving, this kind of support, what form it will take and so forth. Certainly, um, in theory at least, uh, college administrations are supporting this development. Um, it was noted also, however, that some work may have to be done in modifying college systems in order to fully integrate micro-credentials into the student information system. We are based now on a semester system. We are based on uh, traditional credited diploma and degree programs or certificate programs. Some of the uh, infrastructure that supports that would have to be modified in many cases in order to fully integrate the micro-credentials. Another challenge, and this is um, perhaps our, our major one at the moment, is getting the information about micro-credentials out there to the public. Potential learners need to know the advantages of this type of training. Employers need to understand what micro-credentials are and what a person with a micro-credential brings to the workforce. So in order to get this information out, college representatives think that it is important to be clear on a definition, a pan-Canadian definition of micro-credentials. People um, that we interviewed are very interested in collaborating, learning from each other, sharing ideas, but made it clear that there is no one-size-fits-all type of standardization here. A shared definition, great, but we need to have the possibility of regional and demographic differences for sure. The needs in an urban area are different from the needs in the north um, and so forth. Um, indeed, if micro-credentials are meant to respond to the needs of local people and local industry, such differences must be expected and must be respected. And with that, I'll pass the torch on to Jackie. Thanks, Diane. This works here. So you can see my screen okay? And I'll try and turn on my video. There we go. Okay, um, so I'm gonna walk through the results of 
uh, some of HECO's research, which will be reported hopefully in early May. We'll have a public um, version of this report available. So in the meantime, it's um, just a bit of a preview um, and a lot of this work done in collaboration with CICAN. So for those of you who aren't familiar with HECO, we're an arm's length agency of the Ontario government. We conduct research and offer recommendations to improve the quality of higher education in Ontario. All of our research is public and available on our website. So this graphic is taken from a HECO paper on lifelong learning and it's adapted from an original graphic made by an economist named Heather McGowan. Um, and it, it's, I presented here to kind of set the stage for our research on micro-credentials. Our lifelong learning paper made the case that the economy is changing quickly um, and in unpredictable ways. And as time goes on, more and more Canadians are becoming vulnerable to these economic changes. We wrote this report prior to the pandemic, but of course the pandemic has exacerbated the economic vulnerabilities we were writing about. Our paper argued that while we can't predict the specific changes coming down the pike, as a result of this pandemic or otherwise, we can anticipate and prepare for change in general. And one way to do that is by building an agile system of lifelong learning that prepares students to adapt and thrive. An effective lifelong learning model should start by laying a foundation of transferable skills like problem solving, literacy and numeracy, but also instilling a general appetite among students to continue learning. The system should also offer opportunities for students to return to school throughout their working lives via short, affordable and flexible programs. Um, so micro-credentials could help serve to bring this vision of this lifelong learning model to life. So our micro-credential research is a natural extension of our lifelong learning work. Uh, we had two overarching aims driving the research project. One was to help establish some common understanding. We engaged experts from around the world to help us answer questions like, what constitutes a micro-credential? And how is a micro-credential different from say a digital badge or a certificate? We also conducted a literature review looking at definitions being used globally. Our second goal was to gather strategic insights from key stakeholders. We wanted to know how working age adults feel about upskilling opportunities like micro-credentials. What about these opportunities would interest them? Where do they see value? Um, and how do they see that lifelong learning model I shared with you coming to life? We also wanted to know about how employers feel about these opportunities from both a hiring perspective and from the perspective of internal professional development. So to achieve our goals, in addition to conducting a thorough literature review, we conducted interviews with stakeholders, a survey of what we're calling prospective students, and by that we mean Canadians between the ages of 18 and 64 who are not currently enrolled in a post-secondary program. Uh, we also surveyed Canadian employers and we surveyed Canadian post-secondary institutions, uh, which is where we partnered with CICAN. So I'll walk you through the results of our work. I'll start with the definition and typology that came out of our interviews and literature re uh, review. Then I'll pass things over to Sarah, who will walk you through our survey results. She'll focus on the results of our employer and student surveys, mostly in the interest of time, but also because Petra already did a great job of uh, sharing the uh, results of the institutional survey, much of which are the same as ours. Um, and again, all of this will be covered in our upcoming report. So drawing from international definitions and the advice of the experts we interviewed, we developed the definition on the screen. Our definition centers on micro-credentials being shorter and more focused offerings than traditional credentials like a degree or a diploma. We're intentionally descriptive and not prescriptive here. We wanted to offer a definition that accurately describes the full range of programs currently available in Ontario and across Canada while leaving a lot of room for organizations to advance their prescriptive aims. So for example, a college might say that in addition to being short and focused, their micro-credential will be industry relevant and flexible. Um, in other words, we're considering this to be an umbrella definition that definitions like the one CICAN shared earlier can fit within. Um, I'll also highlight that by using the word program, our definition implies an intentional learning experience or pedagogy differentiating micro-credentials from something like a digital badge. Our definition leaves a lot of room for variation as displayed in this graphic. Our goal with this graphic or what we're calling a, a typology is 
To help address some conflation of terms and misguided assumptions about micro-credentials, for example, that they're all offered online, like Diane explained earlier, we know there's examples of, of in-person micro-credentials as well. Uh, to some extent, this same graphic could be applied to most other credentials offered by post-secondary institutions today. Uh, so I know this is a lot to digest, but um, I, I believe we'll be recording this and sharing uh, the slides. And again, it'll be shared in our report uh, coming out in May. So for now, I'll pass things over to my colleague, Sarah, to walk through our survey results. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, so I'll share a few uh, charts from our survey of Canadian employers, which we conducted in-house with support from BHER as well as some slides from our survey of prospective students, which was conducted by Abacus Data. All right, so this chart shows uh, employer respondents in proportion to their level of agreement with the question. We asked them, how familiar are you with the following terms for short flexible credentials? And these terms are listed on the y-axis and they were asked to rate their level of agreement on a five point scale from extremely familiar. So those are the green bars that you see on the chart to not at all familiar. And those are the dark blue bars that you see on the chart. Uh, by and large, employer respondents were not all that familiar with the term micro-credential. 59% of the employers uh, who responded to our survey were not familiar at all with the term and only 10% indicated that they had a good understanding. Respondents were even less familiar with synonymous terms like micro-certification, nano-degree, and nexus degree. Oop, went a bit too far there, sorry about that. All right. Okay, so uh, once provided with the definition, we asked respondents how they uh, would react to seeing a micro-credential on the application of a job candidate. Again, this chart displays employer respondents uh, by how favorably they rated a list of potential micro-credential features, which you see listed on the y-axis. And again, they were rating using a five-point scale, this time from highly favorable, the dark green bars, to highly unfavorable, the dark blue bars. And about 60% of respondents indicated that micro-credentials would increase their confidence in a prospective employee's skills. About two thirds said they would like to, or they would see a micro-credential as highly favorable if it were directly related to the job at hand, competency-based and or accredited. Survey respondents were less interested in the short aspect of micro-credentials, but bear in mind that we were asking them this question in the context of uh, of hiring. We also asked respondents to think about micro-credentials for the purpose of internal staff training and development. This chart and this question are again structured in the same way as the previous slides. Uh, once again, uh, you have your list of potential micro-credential features down the y-axis and respondents were asked to rate uh, how favorably they viewed each of these features uh, on a five point scale from highly favorable, the green bars to highly unfavorable, the dark blue. In this context, nearly 70% said they would have a favorable view of micro-credentials that were competency-based. Alignment with industry and flexibility were the next uh, most favorable features. And in this case, respondents had a relatively positive view of the shorter length of a micro-credential. So now let's turn to our survey of prospective students. Abacus Data surveyed a random sample of 2,000 Canadian adults from ages 18 to 64 who were not currently enrolled in a, a post-secondary program at the time of the survey. This chart displays the proportion of responses to the question, have you heard of the term micro-credential? And while micro-credential isn't unheard of, uh, awareness is relatively low. 25% have heard of the term, and those are our yellow and green bars, but only 8%, the green bar, say they know it well. And survey results indicate that the awareness of the term was higher among younger working age Canadians, those with greater household incomes, and those with a university education. Now, once our survey of prospective 
uh, students were provided with a definition, their interest in micro-credentials was high. 74% of working age Canadians demonstrated an interest in micro-credentials for either professional development, personal development, or both. Uh, respondents said they recognized uh, the value of short focus programs today and in the future with 78% saying upskilling and continual education would be important for future proofing their careers. The Canadian surveyed were also given a list of potential micro-credential features like the ones presented to employers and post-secondary institutions. After affordable and employer recognized, respondents indicated uh, that whether a micro-credential was flexible would be the most important factor. And on that note, uh, I'll turn things back to Jackie to discuss uh, the quality markers we've identified for post-secondary institutions. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. All right. So based on the evidence that Sarah just walked you through, we identified six quality markers that we're suggesting institutions who are developing micro-credentials should strive to incorporate where it makes sense to do so, and that in all cases they should be transparent about. Uh, our survey suggests that Canadians are particularly concerned with whether employers see value in micro-credentials. For employers to see value, as Sarah just said, micro-credentials should be competency-based and assessed. Uh, they should be industry relevant. And employers also demonstrated that they care about accreditation and standardization as well as flexibilities when thinking about micro-credential for um, internal staff de development. Um, flexibility was also really important to prospective students. Stackability needs a bit of unpacking. This is something that colleges and universities care a lot about. Uh, our survey results and CI cans were clear. Employers and Canadians showed less interest in this potential feature. And after our interviews, uh, we at HECO have mixed views about it. Uh, we think it's important that institutions are transparent about how their micro-credentials relate to one another and to other credentials. But we also think that it's essential that micro-credentials, first and foremost, are valuable in and of themselves. So we do caution institutions against modularizing traditional programs unless they are serving adult lifelong learners um, in, a, in a way that is different from how they were packaged previously. Micro-credentials, uh, above all else, should not be replacing traditional credentials, but complementing them. So thinking back to the lifelong learning research that I shared at the beginning of this presentation, our research on micro-credentials reinforces our view that these credentials hold most value for adult learners as a top-up or complement to traditional education, not a replacement. That said, our interviews did demonstrate that they might micro-credentials might also serve other learners. For example, uh, we heard that recent high school graduates uh, might be able to access micro-credentials as an introduction to an area of study before pursuing an academic path or as an introduction to an employment area like a trade before committing. Um, so these themes and ideas will be explored in more detail in our report. Uh, it's now gone through external review and is currently making its way through our publication process. So like I said, we're anticipating it in early May. And that is it for us. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So uh, before we go with the questions, let's do another Slido poll. So uh, you can see it using, a day, again, slido.com. So you can see the questions. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting.
Some people are still thinking about it. <laughs> So we'll take 30 seconds and then we'll stop the polling. As you can see, answer one and two is quite uh, similar so far. And as they said in the French version uh, of the webinar at one o'clock, it could have been one answer or the other. Very, very interesting. Okay, so let's uh, let's stop at this stage and we could come back to the poll later just to see if it has changed or not. So, me, okay, good, perfect. So it is now the period of questions and answers. I know that some of you have already uh, begun to put your questions and I know that some of us have been answering some of those questions. So Mark, you volunteer to uh, read some of the questions. So, and we have our four panelists and myself that would be pleased to answer those. So uh, Mark. Thanks Denise. So the first question come, is a continuation or articulation of a conversation that you had with Rod on some initial question, which is now reformulated. So it'd be great to hear what the panel thinks about this. I'll read that out. So Rod is asking uh, if learning outcomes in terms of competencies are articulated, which is what would inform the extent of portability, et cetera, of the credential, then what would be the value in coming up with a generic pan-Canadian definition by the way, the articulation could come in the form of a digital badge. So that was one question. So maybe I will just start to kick it off. Uh, so the, I'll share with you, Rod, why we started to do this, in fact, and that we started our research. Um, it's because we were talking to a number of people, including employers, learners, as well as institutions, and the word micro-credentials kept coming up, but nobody was talking about the same thing. Sometimes it was an orange, sometimes it was an apple, and sometimes it was a banana, but sometimes it was a carrot. And so at one point we thought, okay, hold on, let's stop. What we need is to have a common definition because if not, it's not fair for learners because anybody could pretend that they are offering micro-credentials. And in fact, they won't all have the same value and the same credibility. And the reasons why we thought it was important to have a, a common definition uh, with common principles was to ensure that whenever people would talk about micro-credentials, we would talk about the same thing at least in Canada. Uh, and of course, this is certainly something that we will be, uh, we, we've examined the definitions that were happening in other countries. And as you know, Canada is a province with 13 different uh, provincial and territorial uh, education jurisdictions. And we felt we need to have something that is common for the learners, because at the end of the day, this is not about institutions. It is about the learners and it's, it is about helping them to upskill or reskill and support them to ensure that they meet the needs of employers and they can progress in their own career. So uh, I don't know if there's any of the panelists that want to address uh, some of the, the questions of Rod. You, okay, Peter. I can speak on a, a little bit uh, from what I gathered from uh, the survey results as well, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, a little bit about the recognition of the term micro-credential and the, the trust that uh, employers and potential students uh, have in the term as well. I think having a common definition of it helps with the recognition and the trust that uh, both those will, that will go through a, a program like a micro-credential and those that employ, those that come out on the other side 
uh, will we'll be able to place in the, uh, in the credential. I think uh, there is a, a lack of, of understanding, there's a lack of, of trust in it, and with a common definition, we get a little bit further towards that uh, in, in both those uh, aspects. Perfect, thank you. I see Jackie. I'll just kind of echo what Petter was saying. We, we conducted several interviews with uh, employers and I think the most common, the, the conversation tended to start with a lot of confusion and what are we even talking about here? And, and then it would inevitably, once we provided or offered a definition of, of micro-credential, it turned to excitement. People were excited about these opportunities and how they could serve them in their industry. We spoke to people, we spoke to uh, a plumber who was really excited about the, the role that micro-credentials could play for future apprentices. We spoke to people in the agricultural sector who were concerned about safety as they're incorporating new technology and wouldn't these be great to bring people up to speed on this new equipment very quickly and effectively. Like there, there was just so much excitement, but the conversation always started with confusion. And I think that as a sector, we need to get past that confusion by just at least internally, at least among colleges and universities, being on the same page about what we mean so that we can tap into that excitement and communicate effectively with employers and with prospective students. Good, Jackie. Oh, oops, sorry. Yeah, go, I, go ahead, Sarah. Very quickly onto what Jackie said. It's also really important when we think about the role that government is going to play in the micro-credential landscape. So here in Ontario, um, the, the provincial government has recently uh, created some parameters for using OSAP, which is the, the provincial student aid uh, for micro-credentials. But in order to do that, the government needs to have some sort of understanding of what a micro-credential is and where it fits within sort of the credential landscape. Uh, and so that's, that's another reason why we need this type of clarity in order to make uh, make sure that students are able to access a piece of learning that actually has a place within our post-secondary system and is not such like a boutique offering from a given institution. Yeah. And it's something at the end of the day that is useful and it can be part of an official program, but it can be an add-on too. And it can be something that make the learner more competitive on the labor market because they have added uh, some knowledge to their, uh, their own box of knowledge that they took within a specific program, for example. There's a question of Patrick that is uh, quite interesting. Now I lost it. Uh, it was about the difference with continuing ed. In fact, it doesn't matter where the, the micro-credential is offered. It could be in continuing ed. And in fact, I would dare to say that colleges for a long time have been offering micro-credentials, but they were just not calling them micro-credentials. Um, and this is certainly something that is important and it can be part of a program, but it doesn't have to be. What is important, it's competency-based, and it's assessed. That's what is important. And it has nothing to do with the duration of the, or, or the length of that course or that micro-credential. Um, Mark, any other question? Yeah, some, there, there's a lot. So we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, there's a very interesting one here from a guest from Europe. I'd like to go to that one next. Um, and this, and our guest says, uh, micro-credentials are a key issue in European educational policies. There are a number of questions. Um, uh, I think that they must have done from a survey in Europe. Uh, the survey indicated that higher education institutions are in optimum position to offer micro-credentials, but at the same time, we see a vast offer and corresponding interest from the public by private providers, including the big online services providers. How do you see the balance, the role of higher education in that context, the links and recognition of achievements gained through such pathways? So that's a great question that I'm sure everyone on the panel could, could contribute to. Uh, I think it's a fabulous question, and uh, the, uh, I have an answer for that, but I will ask my the panelists first to answer it. Uh, Diane. 
Yeah, I could contribute something to it. Um, it, it, it it's interesting because um, uh, one, a couple of colleges that I spoke to talked about working with private providers. And so, uh, you know, making a kind of private public par partnership with that, which is, which is one way that, that people are going in terms of that potential competition, let's say. I think a lot of um, um, colleges are hoping that having the, 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 the seal of a recognized institution recognized by the province is worth a lot in the labor market. Um, granted, you know some of the some of the private providers are providing some good services, but um, the the sort of recognition, having gone through the college approval process, with all that that implies, um, gives gives it a, 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 a gives the training offered by the college uh, a, a great a great deal of importance and 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 hopefully uh, respect in the in the uh, employment sector. The the other piece that was mentioned to me is that. Um, th these big providers, it's a one, one shoe fits all kind of thing. And if we're talking about working with a local population or local industry, we, we, which we are in Canada, and it's so diverse. I mean, the needs in the north are very, very different from the needs in Toronto, let's say, in terms of accessing remote communities, in terms of Indigenous people, in terms of um, the types of training needed and so forth. There's a, there's a great list you could go through that um, LinkedIn learning or something like that d d cannot meet those. It's a, it, it's a one, one shoe fits everybody sort of approach. So that distinction was made a, as well. I'll just say, and Sarah, actually, I, I'm not sure if you know offhand, sorry to put the, the pressure on, but one of the questions in our survey was, uh, we did ask how important it was to yeah. people that the um, the micro credential be offered by a reputable Canadian institution, and, and people did seem to prioritize that. I can't remember specifically how high, but it, yeah. it was something people responded to positively. Yeah. And the other thing is that in our interviews, mostly with post-secondary institutions, we did just hear a lot about the um, kind of the social good drive that that really a lot of this learning should be driven by our public post-secondary institutions and shouldn't be left entirely in the hands of industry. Um, and so while there are industry groups who can provide some of it, it, it makes a lot more sense more often than not for our public uh, institutions to be handling this content and delivering it. And what is interesting, there has been a lot of examples uh, with private uh, uh, with industry, for example, uh, like a partnerships with Siemens, where uh, students, or with Cisco, where stu or IBM, where students get a micro badge, if you want, and uh, but they are done within a college or a university systems, which I think is uh, why you got the, that type of results, Jackie, with respect to the importance. I think it was around 78% if you looked at the two categories, you know, the very important and important 78 to 80, 80 something percent that it was. And uh, they do favor that. And the reasons why, again, a common definitions and principles, why it was so important to come up uh, with it uh, at this stage, it's because we don't want a proliferation of micro-credentials that are all over the map. And we want to ensure that in fact, there's something that is consistent for the country. So I don't know if there are uh, other questions, Mark? Denise, it, there's a, an embarrassing richness of questions. There, there are unfortunately, I think, more questions than we'll be able to address, but I've put a couple of them together that are touching on the same theme for the next one. So we'll see if we, how we can go on that. And I believe we also do have an activity at the end that we still wanted to do before the hour runs out. So here's, here's a selection to kind of together. Um, is there any consensus at this point as to what would constitute a single learning credential. For example, a number of learning objectives. How do we ensure some consistency on how we design them? What do you see playing the role of accreditors? How will quality and consistency of micro-credentials be measured? And can industry be accreditors? So all of those questions are touching on the same theme of consistency, which I think in fact you were just finishing on, uh, on explaining.
Okay, anybody wants to tackle this? I'll just say that at this point um, where we're at and speaking with some groups that are a little further ahead in, in places like New Zealand, I think we're really conscious of the fact that consistency is good to some extent, but at the same time, what's so exciting about micro-credentials is the opportunity for innovation and experimentation. And so we wanna try and establish some consistency without stifling that innovation, um, which is a really tough balance. Um, so I think right now our thoughts are still kind of evolving around how to do that. Um, but I would just put it out there that anyone working on that or thinking about this, really wanting to balance those two things. Uh, there's been some excitement about mastery-based learning and the opportunity to progress faster or slower based on demonstrated mastery, which is really exciting. Um, and that might look very different from uh, a micro-credentials that's structured around seat time. Um, and so we need to think about allowing space for those opportunities and more while also trying to establish some consistency. Uh, Diane? Yeah, there were a lot of different elements in that question and I'll just address one of them. Um, I think in, in terms of quality assurance, for instance, uh, which, was, which was in there, um, public institutions have rather well-developed quality assurance um, procedures in place as is mandated by uh, provincial governments. And um, micro-credentials would be part of that seems to that seems to be the intention of colleges and this is one of the differentiating factors from let's say a non-credit continuing education course where the learners are not assessed where the course is not necessarily assessed with the same rigor as uh, other courses with, within, the, within the college or university. Um, so they, they really see micro-credentials as going through the same institutional um, processes and procedures uh, for quality assurance as would be the case with any other program in the college. Great. I, I won't add anything. I think uh, for, because of time, uh, it's important. Do we have time, Mark, for a, a last question? Sure. And this will make it a short one that's kind of very future focused. So next steps. Uh, somebody asked, comparative costs for micro-credentials aren't available at this point. Do you expect to have more information about this in the near future? And I just heard the laugh. So uh, maybe a nice way to think about next steps. <laughs> I saw that one in the chat and I wrote it down as an area of future research. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't have an answer for it right now. And it's interesting because uh, at one point we, we asked some of the regional association and they could not answer either. They said, oh, we'll come back to you because right now it, it's, it varies. It varies tremendously. And But what is important to remember is part of the survey that was done with respect to learners by HECO. The most important thing for a learner was the affordability. Uh, and that's something that we need to remember. We need to remember that when we talk to government and we, we, we lobby for more funding because it's often a barrier for learners. And because if we're serious about lifelong learning, it means that people need to be able to have access to it. And it means having affordable micro-credentials. So we'll stop here. You want to show us the, the polling where we are at right now, Mark? Okay, okay, so it hasn't changed a lot since, uh, okay, good, perfect, thank you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, I want to thank uh, Peter, Diane, Sarah, and Jackie, and Marquita, you have the last word. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't actually have the last word. You guys will all have the last word. My name is Marquita Evans, and I'm the Vice President of Government and Stakeholder Partnerships at CICAN. Allow me to thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It seems to me like it's the start of a rich conversation. I want to thank uh, Jackie and Sarah for their presentation and looking forward to reading that report in full when it's released. Thank you again to Diane and Petter for all of your work. We have one last poll here 
on Slido. What should CICAN do next on micro-credentials? We're really looking for some feedback. Um, I'll tell you what we have planned. Uh, I've only been at CICAN about three months, but what I can tell you is I think that micro-credentials really play to the strength of colleges. The ability to mobilize quickly, reflect emerging labor market needs, community needs, and offer this competency-based training. And that's the message we're really going to be sharing with policymakers and elected officials. Colleges are the ideal place and the ideal partner for learners and industry to acquire and develop micro-credentials. So we'd love to continue the conversation. We'd love to know more about your plans as you start to think about this. Um, and I welcome your feedback on what CI can should do next. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks a lot, Marquita. Okay, take good care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.